Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our Seton Matters uh, webinar today. Um, we're just going to give it just a couple more seconds. It's just turned two o'clock, but we know there's loads of you already uh, waiting and are in the arrival room. So we're just going to wait a couple of seconds just so everyone arrives with us. Seem to have like, paused there, so on the numbers there, so maybe get started. Uh, so welcome everyone uh, to our webinar today, the key to the uh, effective seat in the assessment process. So I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, Dean Cook. Uh, nice to meet you all. Dean is our global product manager and has real experience on the road um, doing assessments on a practical level. Uh, so he'll be here for our Q&A. Then we also have Kirsty. Kirsty is our occupational therapist and clinical training manager. Uh, Everybody, so hello. Thank you all so much for being here today um, and taking the time out to join us and um, to let you know that we have added uh, ask a question feature there on the screen. So if throughout the, the presentation you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the box there and we'll get them at the end. We're doing a live Q&A at the end of the session. And if you miss anything throughout, don't worry, we'll be sending you a recording of this webinar um, to everybody when it's available. So I think without further ado, we'll get started. Thank you for joining us in this webinar on the assessment process. We call it the hands-on assessment process because you have to get your hands involved to get the answers that you need. Poor assessment equals poor solution. If we conduct a poor assessment, it can lead to things like poor assessment can lead to progression of existing deviant postures, making existing deviant postures worse or it can create new deviant postures. It's an inefficient use of resources and can incur increased cost to you, your patient, or your organization. When conducting your seating assessment, it's essential to have these guidelines in mind. Ensure that you're conducting a holistic assessment. Consider the whole person. Aim to fit the seat to the person and not the other way around. That's why our chairs are fantastic because they are adjustable and modular so that we can adjust the chair to suit the person's needs. Don't focus on the symptom, look at the cause. So look at the reason for that posture. Don't just try and correct it like a band-aid. There may be several right answers. Seating may not solve everything or there may be no right answer. But always allow yourself enough time so that you have enough time to complete a full comprehensive assessment without rushing the staff on the unit or the patient. Some considerations when conducting your seating assessment. Observe the person from the front, the back and the sides and take photos if you gain consent. Talk to the staff who care for the person or the client themselves and find out how long does the person sit in the chair all day? How often are they repositioned? And do they take chair or bed breaks? Identify the age and condition of the current chair. How long have they had it? How old is the cushion? Identify what the current problems are with the seating system. And what other chairs have they tried? And what were the problems with them? Note the skill integrity. Look, don't just ask. When it comes to transfers, ask the questions. How does the client transfer? Is the client still mobile? Is it safe for the client to mobilize? Always observe the transfer method. Ask the staff or the client themselves how often they are repositioned and if there's a repositioning schedule in place. It's so important that you observe the transfer because this way you can assess is that transfer method recommended and suitable for that patient. Assess the sling, if they use one, for weight and support, ensuring that it is adequate and meets the person's needs. And also consider in situ slings, if appropriate. Some patients, particularly those with a diagnosis of dementia, they can find inserting and removal of the sling or using the hoists to cause a lot of distress. So using in situ slings can really benefit their quality of life. Some functional considerations. Consider the activities that the person would like to undertake when in sitting. Think back to those goals of seating. Considering the carer's needs as well is very important. 
Does the carer need a manual chair or would they benefit from a motorised chair? The OT seating assessment is conducted in three stages. The first stage is observing the person when they're sitting in their current chair. The second is assessing the person in supine position. And the third is assessing the person unsupported sitting on the edge of a bed or a plinth. Where do I start? Well, we always start at the pelvis. We start at the pelvis because the pelvis is the cornerstone of seating and we must ensure that the pelvis is stabilised before we assess the rest of the body. So we start at the pelvis and move to the trunk and then the lower limbs, upper limbs and lastly the head and the neck. So let's go back and refresh on the pelvis. These two bony prominences at the front, these are your ASIS. And if you make your way along the iliac spine, you'll find the PSIS at the back. These are the points that you will be locating when you conduct your seating assessment. And the two bony prominences at the bottom, these are your ischial tuberosities, your ITs. This is the part that you will sit on. So when you're assessing the pelvis, you locate the ASIS and the PSIS, and you will identify, is there a pelvic tilt? Is there a posterior pelvic tilt? or an anterior pelvic tilt? Is there any pelvic obliquity? Or is there any pelvic rotation? So part one, sitting in their current chair. What you want to do is observe the person from the front, the back and the sides and take photos if you gain consent. At this stage, you're not going to be correcting anything, you're just observing and taking notes. Note the posture and use the prompts on the assessment form to guide you. If you need any help with your assessment forms, please get in touch and we are happy to send you a version that we created. Consider the time of day, because some people can be more alert or tired during different periods. Part two is the supine assessment. And this is where the person is lying and being assessed on a flat surface. So use a plinth or a firm mattress. Part two is the supine assessment. And this is where we lie the person on a flat, firm surface, so use a plinth or a firm mattress. This is where we can identify if any deformities are fixed or flexible. We are looking for the joint ranges as related to the sitting position. Think about can a desired position be achieved without resistance or pain. During the supine assessment, first you're going to start with the pelvis and you're going to note any tilt, any obliquity or any rotation. You're also going to note is the deformity fixed or is it flexible? Then you're going to move to the trunk and assess is the spine in the trunk in midline position? Is there any scoliosis? Make sure that you assess shoulder position. So is one shoulder higher than the other? Note how much manipulation is needed to achieve a desired position. Then you're going to assess the pelvic to the trunk angle. Let's watch Martina assess hip flexion. So just to recap, when you have the person in supine, you start with the pelvis. You locate the ASIS and the PSIS, and you assess if the person is sitting in an obliquity, in a rotation, in a posterior pelvic tilt, or an anterior tilt. When you have that established, you then want to move down to the hip, and you want to assess how much movement they have at the hip as related to the seated position. So what we do here is we locate the ASIA and we're going to lift the knee up and we're going to flex the hip. And when you come past the point, you will notice that the hips begin to rotate and that is the point where you must stop. And then you measure this angle because the angle of the hip is going to be related to the angle of the back of the chair. When it comes to the lower limbs, we've already seen how Martina assesses hip flexion. But we also want to note if there's any abduction or adduction, or if there's any wind sweeping. It is very important to assess the extension and the flexion of the knees, because this determines where the foot plate should be set, and if tight hamstrings are present. Let's watch a video of Martina assessing a patient's hamstrings. So the next part of the assessment is to assess the hamstring range. 
And because the hamstring go over the hip joint and the knee joint, we need to establish the range of movement at the hip joint first. So we've, we've already done that. We've established the comfortable position of the hip joint. We keep our finger or our thumb again on the ASIS and we extend the knee to see how much range of movement we can get at the knee without resistance. And that's very important because what happens is when you overextend the knee, the ASIS will move down the bed. And this is the same as when the client is sitting in the chair and you elevate the leg rest. What in fact you do is you pull the pelvis down the chair. So you don't want to do that. You need to keep your thumb on the ASIS and ensure that you don't overextend the knee. So this range of movement here is where you sit the leg rest off your chair. It's important to assess if somebody has hip abduction or adduction, because this will need to be accommodated within the chair. Fixed hip abduction will need to be accommodated within the width of the chair, as this will reduce the risk of any pressure injuries at the knees. Then we must assess the lower limbs, so the ankle joint. Is there dorsiflexion or plantar flexion present? as this can be accommodated with the angle adjustable foot plates. And then we get to the head and the neck. We should assess the head and the neck from all positions, from the front, the sides and the back, and again take photographs if you get permission. Assess the cervical curve. Is it neutral? Is there flexion present? Extension or hyperextension? Again, it's important to remember to assess, is it fixed, partially flexible or flexible? Assess the neck position. Is it neutral? Is there lateral flexion? Or is there rotation? Again, is this fixed? Is it partially flexible or flexible? And finally, head control. Assess, does the person have head control? Or are they completely dependent? Part three of the sitting assessment is when we assess the person when they're sitting unsupported. And this has to be on a firm surface with their feet loaded, either on the floor or on a foot plate. You want to observe the posture and the balance. You want to observe the posture and the balance and the weight distribution. Is the person able to sit independently or are they using their hands? Are they hands dependent or are they fully dependent? Go through the same procedure again, starting with the pelvis, then the trunk, then the lower limbs, upper limbs, head and neck. Remember to look for changes in tone. When measuring the client for the chair, ensure you're getting true measurements and not what you think the chair should be. Measure the person when they're sitting in the correct position. When you get your measuring tape, ensure that the tape is pulled taut and doesn't curve around the person's body because this will make the measurement longer than it needs to be. To get the seat depth, measure the legs bilaterally as one leg may be longer than the other. It may be necessary that you ask for assistance of somebody else to help you with this process. Essential measurements in sitting. Some of these measurements may not be necessary when you are recommending and measuring for a clinical therapeutic chair. However, it is very important that we measure the seat width, the trunk width, that we consider wind sweeping, the seat depth and the seat height, footrest length, footrest angle and feet width, back height and back angle and armrest height. When you are conducting your seating assessment, it's very important to consider the seating goals of the person and their caregiver. Goals such as functional goals, for example, feeding, drinking, reading, or any other activity that they'd like to do when they're sitting. Their physiological function, such as facilitating respiration, elimination, digestion, and not forgetting the psychological function, for example, for effective communication, their self-image and their sense of self-esteem. When you have identified the seating goals, identify the top four goals. Write down the goals that are most important for you, for the caregiver and the client. Prioritize these goals and document your decision on the need for this product. Also document any unmet need and why it was unmet. The fitting process then, which some of us call trialing the chair or trying out the chair, are the hips to the back of the chair to ensure the person is sitting in the best possible position. Is the angle of the back accommodating the hip angle? Have you positioned the legs in the best position? 
Is the cushion that you recommended giving maximum support and pressure redistribution? Check the skin before and after the fitting process. Consider, is function optimized? Ask, is the client comfortable? And have you maximized the body contact with the chair? So that there is a thorough seating assessment. But we understand there may be times when it just isn't possible to conduct a full assessment like this. So here are some principles for conducting a basic seating assessment. Critical measure number one, hip flexion. It's very important that we assess hip flexion to understand where we should set the back angle. Critical measure two, knee extension with hip flexed, assessing the hamstrings. We have already discussed the importance of assessing the hamstrings to ensure that we have the right angle for the calf pad and the foot plate. Critical measure number three, hip abduction and adduction. This influences the position of the pelvis and ensures accommodation of any restriction. Critical measure number four, cervical flexion and extension. This is important for visual field, key for feeding position, and limitation in flexion can result in tilt being contraindicated. So the takeaways from this webinar, always take before and after photos if you get consent. Identify, does the posture have fixed or flexible components? Consider, have we identified the cause of the problem? Consider, have we identified the cause of the problem or just the symptom? It's important to have identified the skin risk. Have you assessed skin risk? And have you maximised the footprint for function, comfort and skin? Remember, never correct a fixed posture. We want to accommodate fixed postures and we want to correct flexible postures. As Seating Matters, we have developed the Clinician Seating Handbook and this is free for you to request. Just go to our website and we will post it to you www.cdmatters.com Please get in touch with us if you have any questions or need any more information on the assessment process. Thank you for joining us. Uh, welcome back everyone. Um, so we've had a few questions in the chat. Um, I know some people, um, the video, um, they had a few issues, but don't worry, the recording will be available afterwards and it'll be sent out as soon as we're finished. Um, so there's just one question in the chat there. Um, Kirsty maybe wants to take it. Um, can you explain to me what wind sweeping is, please? Okay, so wind sweeping is different to pelvic rotation, and these two get quite um, confused sometimes. So pelvic rotation, I'll just get my, my pelvis here. Pelvic rotation is when the pelvis is rotated. Okay, so we understand what that is. And then wind sweeping is when the legs... Are, one is abducted and one is adducted, so the hips are swept to the side. And it's more than just the legs that are involved. If you think about when somebody has a fixed wind sweeping of their hips, what we we have to accommodate that wind sweeping, otherwise it will pull the whole trunk. So the pelvis will rotate and the trunk will rotate. So if somebody has wind sweeping, we have to accommodate the legs um, if it's fixed in order to maintain um, the best optimum function and best sitting footprint. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, we also, I think we have a blog on windsweeping um, and we definitely have webinars on it if you go to the Seating Matters website. Um, but if you want more information, if you look at the Clinician Seating Handbook as well, we have all about windsweeping in there too. Is that okay? Um, I hope that answers uh, yeah. your question. Yeah, if you have any more questions, make sure to pop them in the chat there. Um, we have another question, and we might need a bit of clarity on it um, from Victoria. Um, Kirsty might know the answer. Me and Dean's not just 100% sure. Can you give an example of when tilt in space is contraindicated? Yeah, contraindicated, yeah. 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 I can answer that one if you like. If somebody has uh, is hyperextended, if they have a fixed hyperextension like this and their neck is up, if you, if you, even if you practice this yourselves, if you put your head nice and high up in the air like that, if you were to tilt that chair back, what you're going to do in effect is you're going to tilt the person all the way back and they're going to be looking up at the ceiling. And then that obviously is going to compromise their breathing, their swallowing and their eye contact as well, their, their field of vision. So that's one reason why it would be contraindicated. Um, perhaps if somebody has issues with swallowing as well, 
And that's why it's a really good idea if somebody does have issues with swallowing and, and some kind of condition like that to get the SLT involved because she'll be able to help you when um, recommending degrees of tilt for somebody like that. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. And um, we have another, um, it's not really a question, it's just please can you email out your seating assessment? Uh, yep, so you might see on your screen there's a materials section, so it's in there as well, but it's also, we'll also send it in the follow up email. So uh, once we're finished here, we'll follow up email, include some resources, um, the link to our next webinar, and it'll also have the recording for today. So feel free to share it with your colleagues or anyone else who you think would benefit from it. Uh, so if anyone else has a few more questions, uh, just pop them into the chat there. I think something that probably um, comes up quite a lot is some people don't know the difference between tilt and space and um, back recline. So Dean, do you maybe want to? Yep. So, so back recline is basically when the back angle of the chair just opens and closes. And we use this here really to accommodate patients that maybe have a fixed angle at the hip. Patients who are maybe fixed and posterior pelvic tilt, that we can just open up the back angle to accommodate the patient's hip angle. Tilt and space then moves the chair as one. So all the angles that we have set up at the hip, at the knee, tilt and space allows that chair to move together for effective uh, pressure redistribution. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Uh, Kirsty, have you anything to add? Yeah, I was just thinking if, if all is quiet, I might just um, add in. Um, I was recently training in my postgrad studies on posture mobility. Um, and what I learned was Martina in the video said that when we're looking at hip flexion, we're to hold on to the ASIS and feel for the movement when we're when we're flexing the hip. But what I learned in my postgrad was sometimes that can be a little bit tricky to find. Um, to find and feel the movement. So if you had um, a sliding glove, it's great, and you can put it under the sacrum. And if you have one hand under the sacrum and one hand flexing the leg, that can also um, be really helpful when you're doing that assessment. Um, if anyone actually is interested, there's um, some great resources on seating assessments that we have actually looked at um, from Sharon Sutherland and Jennifer McKee. It's posturemobility.com. I'd recommend that you check them out as well. They have some great online courses too. Yeah, and um, we just have a bit of a poll here. So we'll just start with this first one. Um, so we're really interested. We've done quite a lot of training days across the UK and Ireland um, in the last couple of weeks. Um, so we just want to know, um, is it super assessment something that you do or how, what way do you assess? And if you want to put any of your comments in the chat there, that would be really great. Yeah. So I quite a lot of people saying no there. And, and you know, that's not common depending on the setting that you're working in. Some yeah. settings you just don't have the time, you don't have the resources to do a full supine seating assessment. So that is understandable, but it's really great for us to understand what you guys are doing in your assessments and help us to help you guys. Yep, so just sh I'll just share the results. I think most people have... Um have voted already, so we'll just share the results with you all. Um, so 75% saying no. Um, so just have another question in the, in the chat there. So any positive stories of successful outcomes following assessments? So I'm sure you both have loads. Um, Dean used to be out in the road and has loads of great stories um, <laughs> with the Monaco. So, um, yeah, I think, um, I think it's quite difficult sometimes when we're out in the road to accommodate people that really have tight hamstrings. So although some of our chairs, our tilt and space chairs, have a negative uh, leg rest angle, um, if you have anyone that's contracted beyond what that angle allows, it can be quite difficult to seat them and to get them in a good midline um, position. But we have a chair called the Monaco and another chair called the Atlanta, which don't have the calf pad of the plate on the chair. And that really allows those patients that are really contracted to get their the, their legs in underneath the chair and it allows the carers actually to get a much easier midline position first time um so if any is having experience with uh patients that have contractures and you haven't be, been able to seat them and tilt in space maybe when you try to get them in there is they're being pulled into a posterior pelvic uh tilt position maybe they're being rotated because they can't get in underneath the chair um we would heavily advise to try the, the Seat Matters Monaco or the Seat Matters Atlanta, and you'll find that it's much easier to get a, a good midline position with these patients. Yeah, 
Kirsty, do you want to add anything to um, any positive stories you want to share before we go back and a few questions? Well, it was it actually brings to mind an assessment that I did with a little lady who had quite a kyphosis, a, a, a curvature of the spine. Um, and the chair that she was sitting in, because she had a kyphosis, her bottom wasn't able to get to the back of the chair. So she was in posterior pelvic tilt and constantly sliding in this chair as well. But because we assessed for her postural deformity, we were able to sit her really nicely in the Phoenix chair, um, which um, allows the person the, the person's back to be supported when they have a kyphotic curvature of the, the spine. So she's no longer sliding and much more comfortable and safe. Yeah, and we just have one question there just off the back of our poll. Um, I suppose maybe we just think everyone knows what a supine assessment is, but um, maybe if you want to go into a bit more detail, uh, Dean, do you want to start? Or? A supine assessment is really when we assess someone um, from a flat position. So if you didn't see the videos early, um, earlier with Martina doing the assessment on the bed, assessing for a hip rotation, hip um, obliquities, you can set, set or tight hamstrings, all done from a flat position. That is what we call a supine assessment, and that really allows you to get the most accurate measurements. Um, and then we would follow on to a seating assessment. Yeah, exactly. And the benefits of a supine assessment is it just eliminates gravity. So you're able to assess, are these joint ranges, are they fixed or are they flexible? Um, and that way you can either accommodate the deformity if it's fixed, or you can try and correct the deformity if it's flexible. So there's just one more question there. Um, do we have a phoenix? Do you have a phoenix chair behind you? Um, so yes, well spotted. And um, we have a phoenix here. And um, so this is phoenix two. So Helen, just um, what Kirsty was talking about, about her lady with the kyphotic posture. With the phoenix, we can actually um, bring this headrest section in to help support the kyphosis. And then using tilt and space, we can bring the chair back. And that really allows your people that have present with that very kyphotic posture to not only get head support, but to be able to allow it to see them around a lot better around in the room. Any other questions on the Phoenix? I think there's one more in there. Um, do you have any hands-on training sessions? So yes, if um, we'll include it as well in the link. Um, but if you also go onto our website, we do lots of um, in-person training. So it could be that we come to your facility and if you think you have your team, your OT team, your PT team, and we could come out to you. Or we also do seat and master classes. Um, so we're running those across the UK and Ireland at the minute. So the next one is in Solihull in Birmingham in England. So that's on the 27th of March. There's only three or four spaces left for that. Um, so be quick. And the next one is in uh, Bristol South. It's on the 24th of April. And we have just released one uh, for London. And it will take place on the 28th of May. And that's a Tuesday. Um, and then that's us for the summer season. And then we are currently planning for the autumn and next year. So uh, we'll come back. Well, if you have any interest, maybe just pop it in the chat there. We'll keep you in mind if none of those areas suit you um, for the future. Uh, so there we just have another couple of questions. Loads of questions coming in now. Uh, Helena, uh, do the Atlanta or Monaco come in paediatric sizes? Helena, it really depends on what you mean by paediatric sizes. They will. The Monaco will go down to uh, 14 inches and a 14 inch seat depth and a 15 inch seat to footboard height. So it can go down quite small. Um, the Atlanta can go down to a 14 inch seat width, but the seat depth and seat height is a wee bit higher. So, you know, if you've got um, uh, older children, maybe not pediatric, smaller children, but you can, you know, we do do a lot of the sizes with those measurements. We can fit your slightly older children in the chairs. And that's another question on pediatrics. What's that for? Are question? there any specific considerations when assessing children? i.e. Um, what's different when assessing children? Kirsty, do you have any experience really? That is, I think that's a question that I'd rather take offline. If you wouldn't mind, can we get that person's details there and we can talk to them specifically? And we might save that for another webinar in the future. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, we just have another poll. Um, we, have lo we get loads of, um, when we do this on the road, um, a lot of people are scared of um, 
doing assessments. We find that a lot of people are a bit scared of doing assessments. So there's a couple of options there. And um, we just kind of want to know um, wh what the fear is. And um, so if you just want to let us know, and um, obviously we talk about it in our master classes, but the handbook has a really great section on the assessment process and justification. Uh, so if you want to, it's on the learn page, if you haven't already got your clinician seat and handbook, so it's got a really great uh, section on that, writing it out step by step, uh, your measurements, your justification, uh, identifying the correct chair. So there's quite a lot. Still quite a few coming through there. Chair identification seems to be the main one. Maybe most people would have won. Just give it a couple more seconds so people vote. Uh, Kirsty, you've been doing assessments for quite a while now. Um, did you have a fear when you started out or my do you know my fear was actually using the goniometer, you know, the tool that you use to get the angles. Um, and I don't know why, but I, I just had a fear of using this like it was so complicated. But actually, once you get your hands on one yourself and you figure out how to use it, it's so simple. Um, you can buy them really cheap on, on Amazon even. You can go on Amazon and get, get your hands on a goniometer. Um, it's just practice. You really have to practice all these things. Um, something really interesting that I learned as well, and Martina talks a lot about loading the body in the chair. When you're doing your assessment, when the person's in their current chair, to check is the body loaded. So is the body in contact with the chair? And you really have to use your hands to figure this out and put your hand in between the person's head and follow the body all the way down. Don't be don't be afraid to get in there and really feel is the body loading, because this obviously will determine um, the risk of pressure injuries if there's more weight on one side than the other or if there's no contact with the back of the chair. So always remember to check is the is the body loaded when you're doing your seating. I think I see a lot of people there saying again about tight hamstrings and it can be difficult to to measure hamstrings especially in a supine assessment so um, sometimes it's easier once we get the chair out to get the person up in the sling and nearly allow gravity it, you'd be surprised how quickly someone's tight hamstring can relax over time um, and getting them up into the chair sometimes it's really difficult to tell unless they're in the chair and they're given time to relax so um, sometimes that's just about getting the chair out and trying them on it. Yeah. Uh, if there's any more questions, um, this is probably your last chance. Um, there, oh, quickly. Um, so, um, what is that instrument you mentioned? And uh, please for measuring the angle. So, we'll probably send that out because it's quite a long word. But, Kirsty, do you want to just explain again? Yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking for my one. Here we go. This is my one. So one of, the, one of the arms stays straight and static while the other one gets the angle. So when you're getting like hip um, ranges, you're able to see what how far the hip can flex. And same with hamstrings, you're able to put this way, you're able to see how much the legs can elevate without feeling any restriction or pain. Really cheap. It's a goniometer. Um, so definitely get your hands on one. And I think before you got that, Christy, you used an app called Clinometer. Is that right? That's, yeah, that's right. You can use an app. It's a bit fiddly, I learned, but even to practice yourselves at home, if when you don't have one, there's plenty of free apps out there. Um, a goniometer app. Yeah. Um. So just another one. I think Dean, Dean, yep. you're happy enough to answer. So, any recommendations for amputees who have con contractures in that particular leg who have also developed wind sweeping? So again, this really comes down um, to whether we can match the angle of the, if the patient needs tilt space, it's been able to determine whether the negative angle leg rest can match the contraction on their leg. Um, that would ideally be where we would want to go for amputees to be able to tilt them back. Um, but if we can't match that, then probably something like the Monaco or the Atlanta um, that just gives you a wee bit more room under the chair. And in terms of the one sweeping, if it's uh, if the one sweeping is fixed, it's just been able to accommodate that with the correct seat width. And if anybody does have um, patients in mind that they're thinking they're not sure how to seat, please get in touch, and we will pass you on to the seating specialist in your area. Because you can hear listening to Dean, all seating specialists are real experts and have great experience 
and we'll be able to help you and give you advice. Yeah. Um, so just have another question. Um, Kirsty, um, you're very passionate about this when we feel it towards you. Um, so Monaco versus Atlanta. Would Atlanta be the chair of choice for dementia? So um, for everybody listening, Kirsty will fight over us. Yeah, Kirst Kirsty's a real Atlanta fanatic, and uh, we call Dana Monaco maniac. So um, this might create a bit of debate. But Kirsty goes first. Um. For me personally, I've had so much success with the Atlanta. Um, you wouldn't be able to sway me towards any other chair. Sorry, <laughs> Dean, but I, I just love the Atlanta and, and the benefits it gives the patients, um, mainly because for dementia patients, giving them that lower center gravity and making them feel safe and secure, the, the tilt and recline feature on the Atlanta lets the person really sink low into the chair. Um, and I just find that when the person is relaxed who has dementia and has that sensory information, that they're so much more relaxed, they're so much more functional um, and a better quality of life. But again, that's my opinion. I would recommend and encourage everyone to try the Atlanta for themselves with their patients, um, particularly those who have dementia, because no other chair that I found even comes close to the benefits. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the Atlanta has been, um, accredited by the Dementia, Dementia yes, Services Development Services at, at the University yeah. of Stirling. Um, so it and our Sorrento have both been accredited. And Kirsty does a great presentation on um, uh, seating for dementia care and the kind of considerations. So you can see recording, recordings of those on our website um, under the Learn section. And also, um, Kirsty is going to be presenting um, on these at the Alzheimer's Society Conference at the Alzheimer's Care and Dementia Show um, coming up in May and June time. So if you're going to any of those, make sure you um, put it in your diary that Kirsty will be speaking on that at both events. Uh, so we have one more question um, following on from our, for, our earlier amputee question. Um, Dean, I think you'll answer this. Yep. Would the Monaco support a fixed kyphosis follow on from my amputee question? So yes, the monocle can absolutely support a fixed kyphosis. The monocle has um, 20 degrees of ramp in the seat and back angle recline. So essentially you're tilting that person's pelvis back by 20 degrees. Um, so you are getting, although it is a very functional position and it looks quite upright, you are put, putting that person into a certain element of tilt and that can help bring the head back along with a waterfall back, which you can adjust to help the kyphosis sink into the back or even A lateral back that has the recessed middle section, that can also help the, uh, support the person's kyphosis as well. It really just depends on how fixed they are and how severe the kyphosis is. Um, yeah, um, so we have another question just in on the chairs, but maybe just do a quick run through of what all our chairs behind us are. We wouldn't have time to just go into them in detail, yeah, but so, we'll just do um, a quick so this, this would be the Monaco, which has independent seat ramp and independent back recline. This is the Atlanta chair that has seat ramp, which is integrated with back recline. This is what Kirsty was speaking about that works very well with uh, dementia clients. This is the Milano chair, which is a tilt and space chair. This is the Sorrento 2, which is really just a, a, an upgrade, uh, a more adjustable version of the Milano. The Phoenix 2 really is sort of our, our level three, our really high-end tilt and space chair that just provides much more shoulder and head support. This is our Sydney Go Flat, which really is um, designed for ICU and high dependency wards. It can go into a flat position to enable patients to do a lateral transfer from bread and bring them up slowly into a seated position, help them mobilize much easier and, and much quicker. And finally, we have our um, Orlando chair, which is our, our new uh, riser recliner, a tilt and space riser recliner. So there's various different sizes, um, different angles of rise, different backs. Um, and there's a, also a, a, a bariatric version of it, which will go up to 70 stone as well. Uh, yeah. Hopefully that's a brief yeah. overview yeah. of them. And you can find um, all the... Details of each chair, their instruction manual, 
um, and their CGI is nearly always on our website. Uh, so if you just go into our therapeutic seating range on the website, you'll get more details. And of course, um, email us after the webinar. And we're happy to provide more information. We're happy to tell you who your seating specialist or your distributor is in your area and put you in touch if you want to um, try those or demo those chairs. And so just one more question. I think we have time. Just this one maybe do us after this question. Um, does the older Sorrento tilt and space forward? Forward. Yep. Yep. So Victoria, the, the Sorrento one and the Phoenix one have a forward tilt option on them. Um, there's three different uh, tilt options on them, older frames. So you can absolutely put the chair into a forward tilt setting to help with, uh, you know, patients here are still using stand aids or, or, or transferring with assistance. So if any, no one else has any more questions, I think we'll probably wrap it up uh, there. Um, and see there's a question about CPD certificates. So after the webinar, you will get an email from GoToWebinar, which is the platform we're using today. That will have a certificate of attendance for um, this training. Then there'll also be, yeah. And then there'll also be a follow-up email from Seton Matters ourselves, just with all the resources. So just keep an eye out for both of those. And on the Seton Masterclasses, there are, for those who attend, there is CPD certificates available. And um, they are sent out afterwards. Um, I see someone hasn't got theirs from the last one we did, but I'll follow up with that separately. Um, so I think that's us. Um, thank you very much, Dean. Thank you all very much. Thank you, right, before we Before we go, I just want to remind everyone that, you know, if you do have further questions or if you want any advice or support, please get in touch with CD Matters and they will forward on your email to myself and Martina and we'd be more than happy to help you um, along the way in your seating assessments. But thank you all so much for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much, everyone.